He has been and is the CTO of several companies, including one of them, Swudo, and the other one, Oxid. He was voted by T3N as one of the top 10 people in German e-commerce. I think that sounds quite good so far. So he shall teach you how to build an MVP. Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen of NFQ Asia, all the way from I don't know where, Lars Jankowski. Welcome on stage, Lars. <laughs> Hello and welcome on stage. Stage is yours. <laughs> Gentlemen, ladies, I'm so happy to perform right after Stefan Raab. Awesome. I think this is the best spot I could get. So I have to compete with um, uh, Stefan's uh, performance skills and lunch. I would have voted for lunch instead of hearing uh, my talk. Um, because the bad news is I'm really, really bad at good dancing and I'm also bad at bad dancing. So you will not see me dance and I can't perform um, really, really good here. I was, when I saw my positioning of the talk, I was thinking like, shit, uh, I have no chance uh, from their presentation skills to entertain you. So I was thinking like we do it quite interactive and I was wondering why you're sitting here and what you want to learn and what you want to do. Uh, but then I thought going without a presentation completely is a little bit low, yeah, you will think I'm lazy and you paid a lot of money. Uh, also, I'm not getting paid here, but you paid a lot of money, so I want, want to give my best. So I come up with a short presentation about what I think is the most important uh, core messages I want to give you on your way about building an MVP. I will rush a little bit through the presentation and um, I wish that you really use that tool and uh, send us the questions later so that, that actually we can do it a little bit more interactive because I really wonder why you're sitting here and why you're not working on your MVP, which is actually the best way to get your MVP done. Not listening to me, but sitting back at your desk with your text or coding yourself and get your MVP done. So I really wonder what you want to learn. All right, so first, what is an MVP? Uh, uh, it starts, uh, so the official uh, <clears throat> description from Wikipedia is it's that version of a product the team uses to collect the maximum amount of validated learning. My reality, I've learned the hard way over the last 20 years is actually the thinking of you guys that an MVP is the full-fledged product with all the bells and whistles for a tiny amount of money and an even more smaller amount of time. So that is the reality of a founder. As a tech guy, uh, it's always pretty hard for me to, to deal with that because for me it's like, okay, uh, what is your MVP? What is minimum for you? What you really need? What is your core value? And everybody's like, oh, no, I need this, 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 this. I was just recently one a team of mine is working on a uh, MVP or did work for MVP for a German customer and they were like um, starting before we even build the product they were start to discuss with, with our uh, team uh, the whole back office and how they will actually handle all the orders and how the call center agent will, will handle their the, the, the sales and the cancellation and the refunds, even without the possibility to buy. And I'm like, guys, what are you doing? This is not what an MVP is about. It's about learning, getting out there fast, see how you can be uh, successful uh, and how you need to tweak your product. Because like, I mean, I don't need to tell you about all these uh, amazing companies who actually uh, were more or less like accidentally successful. For example, uh, YouTube, which I think most of you will know that, that they never intended to be a, a video platform, but they realized, oh, this is what working, so let's do this. So that's, that's the whole idea of an MVP. So what you want to do is you will to want to build something small, please, yeah? not everything. Get into the market quickly that you can learn real feedback from your users. And if it's not working, trash it. Or if you see something working, pivot 
and move toward the right direction. I mean, that's the whole idea of an MVP. There, is, there are actually two concepts I want to share with you. Who have heard of you of the term SLC? Uh, one. Oh, that's so many. Everybody else is asleep, I think. Um, so, simple, lovable, and complete. So, the, the theory behind the SLC is that they say, in order for the product to be small and delivered quickly, it has to be simple. And simple is good, incomplete is not. Yeah? And it has to be lovable. And a message from my side is, I, that's also one of the things I've, I've learned. Most founders forget about the lovable part. They are like, my product is awesome, I'm doing this. But they forget the real world people. And what you always should do is when you're out there, you should think like, who is actually using my product? Who, is the, who are the real users and what do they think? Do they really use it? Do they really like it? Do they love it? Yeah? And what do I need to do to, that they love it? Um, one uh, story of my past, I uh, tried to tell it without naming. There is a, uh, when we did our Swudu startup, uh, we visited many um, journalists and media companies, big newspapers, and one of the biggest newspapers you all know, I'm no, not knowing a name, they actually, there was the editor-in-chief sitting there, and behind the editor-in-chief there was a wall with a lot of pictures of very weird people. And we talked to them, and, and then after the interview is done, we're like, uh, can I ask you a question? I mean, uh, what, um, what are these people doing there? And he said, like, yeah, well, you know, we did uh, a year ago, we asked our users to send ourselves uh, pictures of themselves so that we know who is reading our newspaper. And this is kind of the best of. So, and whenever I, I edit an article and I review it, I read it, then I turn around, look at them, and I think, mm, maybe I need to write it a little bit more simple. So that's the reality. But it might be you will think, oh, this is a little bit funny, but that's the reality. They do something for the real users, and that's how you create success. And there are many ways to generate love. The Americans, they would say, like, wow, I mean, elegant user experience combined with a delightful UI. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, it's so simple. Just do, do it. Yeah? The attitude and the culture of the company itself, or simply do something which your customer love because they really need it. And I think this is more my German soul. <laughs> I, I don't care so much about like making something awesome. It's more like people really love it because they need it. Uh, or they believe they need it. Even better, when we did Swudu back in the days, well, there are other 400 other uh, flight search engines out there, but people thought like, wow, Swudu is the best. Yeah? Because we actually hammered it into their brains with a lot of TV advertisement. That works also. Um, all right, then. The rat, the riskiest assumption test, that's a complete different angle. So what you do here is actually you test very explicit in a small test, what is the smallest experiment you can run to validate your biggest assumption. Let me give you an example that sounds a little bit theoretical. One of the startups uh, we've co-founded and which is actually really, really successful right now, they had an assumption, uh, for sure in the travel market, they had made an assumption about how, for how much money they can actually buy users online and how they can convert them. So what we did is we actually, to test that, we actually came up with a fake website, fake travel website, placed Google AdSense AdWords, paid for them, and had also a fake funnel for order to test um, what is the conversion rate and how does our funnel look like. There, there was no product. There was nothing. There was like static web pages which looked good for sure. They looked legit. Yeah? And we could test. So in the end, we told the user, oh, sorry, you can't actually... Uh, we just redirected them to some other uh, web page. But we learned a lot. We learned, okay, we can, we can 
uh, buy traffic for that amount, and the conversion rate is going to be that, and will it fly or not, even before we invested in creating the real, real product. And that is exactly the RAT approach. So if you will base your product on some assumptions where you would say, like, I'm pretty sure I can get users to use that by that channel, and they will convert like this, or they will do that, you should test it. You can test it under a different name. You can test it under a different domain. Back to Swoodoo, we did run a lot of TV advertisement under different names. We had like Flug Supermarket, which is Flight Supermarket, for example, um, which was just a redirect, but we could test media. We could test uh, how many users really uh, saw that spot, how, how they converted compared to other. So when all this testing and learning is really, really important. So that's a complete different approach. So depending on your business model, you will say like, okay, it doesn't make sense. There is not nothing small I can test. There's just like, um, uh, I need the big product and then people will love it, okay. Um, if it's like that, you need, you need to, to move more uh, into the direction of the SLC. But if you have some assumptions where are really, really small, go into the red direction. The lovable part and the complete part, this um, uh, we, we repainted a little bit, but actually that is a very famous picture taken um, uh, from Spotify, where they say like, okay, what is an MVP? An MVP is not first the tire, and then the chassis, because this is not complete. If you deliver first a skateboard, then a roller, then a bicycle, that is a complete evolving product, and people have a chance to love your product. If you only de uh, deliver them a wheel, what they're supposed to do with that? Yeah. I could name some companies, I won't, but I could name some companies where I'm pretty sure they just don't, uh, users don't understand. I have actually one, one of our uh, clients, they do have a real good product and the founder is so, they, he loves the product, but he's the only person on earth who understands the product. I tried this app 10 times and he explained it to me many, many times. I always fail and all the other users fail also. How can you, how can you be successful? It, it doesn't work. Um, also, I have a lot of uh, experience working with um, Rocket and they are real masters in creating, uh, I call it like a Potemkin village. So, so you have everything user facing is fabulous. It looks awesome. It looks great. It looks like an awesome product, but actually behind um, you see nothing is done. So typically, you would solve everything with interns. And I found it quite funny when, when actually Stefan Raab on stage said like he wonders if there's a real uh, a machine or if it's an intern just pretending to be a machine. I've seen so many startups doing that. And yes, this is exactly the way to go. If you would, for example, come up with a, I don't know, a new machine learning uh, algorithm which will make automated advertisement on Facebook much more sufficient, uh, efficient uh, than everybody else. Yeah, you could, you, what you can do is you can actually invest millions and years into developing the machine learning algorithm and then you can try if you can sell it and maybe nobody uh, will buy it. Or you just pretend you have that algorithm you will see if you have a target audience and your customers will buy it. And once you know people are interested and they buy it, well, then you have a problem, actually, because you somehow need to weasel your way through uh, not losing these customers. But meanwhile, you very rapidly, hopefully, uh, can actually develop the real algorithm. That's, that's, that's how an MVP works. If you would lose a year of time because you're saying like, no, 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 I need first have to have everything perfect in order and everything need to work perfectly, it's not just not going to happen. Eric Ries, I, I like that uh, quote from him when he said like, uh, how much minimal, probably much more minimum than you think, and I can really, really repeat that sentence, it's very important. 
MVP, there is the word minimum. And I can assure you, everybody of you who will have an MVP in your mind, you all think, yeah, minimum. I can guarantee you, if I talk with every single one of you, it's not minimum what you are having in your mind. You always, because we as a founder, we have love for our product. We have a vision. We think like, this is it. Awesome. This is what we're going to do. Um, but this is not necessarily the minimum what your users need and what your users will love. So for the rat, this what you're testing and why you're testing. Do you need SLC? Do you need uh, to run only a small test? So come up with a few takeaway values, yeah? So think of minimum, decide in which direction you need to go. Sometimes you can go in both directions. Don't forget the Potemkin village. It has to look awesome for your users. That has to work. Everything needs to be a smooth, really cool, lovable experience for your users. Everything in the back end, you can hire interns. You can solve it somewhere. There's a lot more things you can do manually that you would believe of. And focus, focus on what is important. Focus is the most important. Don't waste your energy in thinking of how to solve processes which you will have to deal with in a year once you will have thousands of users. It's good, okay, to think a little bit about it, but not, not spend a lot of time. Focus on first getting a product out there which people really use and love. How? So um, I stole that picture from, my, uh, from our homepage. So what the message in that is actually, don't forget MVP is, the, in, your few, in your mind you will think like, oh, this is, this is my product. Yes, it is. It's the moment in which you go live. But once you go live, the, the real work only starts. Once you go live, you need to continuously improve your product, learn, measure, get feedback. Ah, this is working, this is not working. People like that, people don't like that. This is my customers, I can sell this feature, I can't sell that feature. And then change, 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 change. And that is really important also when you develop it, that you keep it in mind. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So how can you develop it? I've talked to many people who say like, oh, I go to an agency and there are so many agency and they will make me an offer, a fixed price offer, and then I will have my MVP. Um, okay, let me just make a small reality check. So who of you here did or is doing right now or want to do an MVP? Okay, maybe half. So what are the other half doing here? <laughs> I'm wondering, okay, maybe it's less like cozy or they like to listen to my voice and can be lulled into sleep. Anyway, so half. So, and who of you uh, did or plan to utilize an agency for having that MVP done? Wow. Only one I'm very happy in. I will let you know now why you shouldn't. <laughs> so it's quite, well, the good news is there are many and you have a fixed price. That's on the upside. But the downside is, and that's really important, that, that the source code and the source code is important for you because you will have to live with this product given it's successful for a long time that this product, that source code is, that is not necessarily good. Actually, it will be guaranteed not good. Why? Because you don't pay the agency for that. You pay them a fixed price for features, working features, and that's what they will deliver, but not necessarily what is under the hood. So they will actually give you a Potemkin village of your product, which will look all awesome, but un under the hood it might be hacked. There is also, and that's even worse, no guarantee that the same people who did your MVP will be available to improve your product. So you go live, you learn, you actually see, oh, I gained traction and now I need this, 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 this. But maybe these people are working on some completely different project because they're not sitting around if the agency is successful. So somebody else will work on that and that somebody else will have no idea about the product and what the others before did. So they need to relearn everything and that will A, take longer and B, also have a negative impact on uh, quality. And 
And I also have seen that happening many times, given that you're successful, they gave you a really good price, cheap, 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 yeah? And then later you are successful, these guys are the only persons who actually can improve and maintain your product, and then they will ask you for a lot more money. Yeah? So why wouldn't they? If they were smart, they do that, because that's the world, unfortunately, in which we live in. Freelancers. Who of you is using freelancers? Two, three, four. Wow, a little, a few more. So, also really good because there are many, many, many. Yeah, and they can usually can start quick, quickly. The downside is the same like agency. There is no guarantee that the same people are, will be. Uh, available for improvement. There's also no guarantee that the prices will stay reasonable. And most important, unless your MVP can be done by one or two persons, you will have to deal with managing these people. And let's assume you have a small team of three or five people. These three or five freelancers would be typically located all around the globe. We are living in a very global work world. You will have a Brazilian front-end engineer. You will have a Russian back-end engineer. You maybe have a German there or not, and maybe someone from the US. And these all need to work together and you need to manage that. There is a lot of work in that to get these people to work together and interact and work properly, unless you find a bunch of freelancers who can already work together. But this is typically called agency then. Who of you has already your own team? Wow, that's actually the very best option, yeah? Uh, this is what you need, quite simple. The, the downside of that is that pretty high costs and you, typically it also takes a while. Also, uh, don't underestimate, if you are a startup, all the good engineers on earth want to work for a startup because they all want to be employee number one at the next Facebook. But they all learned the hard way that you might not be the next Facebook and startups fail. So the really good engineers will, will, will have a hard time to decide to work for you unless you have traction and you have a name. So and while you're really, really small, it's quite difficult to get really good people to commit and buy into the idea. So in a way that also will help you to improve your sales skill because like you sell to investors or you sell to your customers, you need to sell to these engineers. This is what actually, um, why they should work for you for little money and a lot of fame because you will be the ne next Facebook. Not so easy, not everybody can do that. And last but not least, the same like for the, for the freelancers, you need to manage them and managing your engineers need time. Unlike, unless you will have a manager, uh, but then you grow already, depending on the stage of your company. So the best thing is you need a tech co-founder yeah, who can create a product and can create a team. Well, that is easy said. Yeah? Uh, they don't grow on the trees like bananas, the tech co-founders, but if you would have someone, that is actually the best solution. So what is important here? If you work with any external people, negotiate a deal that you have access to these people later and ideally can insource them at a certain point of time if you need that. There are contract types with agencies. You can talk to freelancers. Um, this is possible, so you should do that, that you have access. The second thing is do not rely on salespeople telling you everything is awesome. Meet the engineers. If you decide to move forward with a company in the Ukraine or wherever, you need to go there. And you need to meet the engineers who are working on your product. You need to get to know them and understand this is, oh, this is the people, oh, these five. And then you pr pretty quickly will realize who are the really important in that team. And these guys, you try like, hey, come on, let's have dinner, let's have lunch, and build a personal relationship to these people. The more, the better you are uh, in a personal relationship to these engineers, the better it is for you later to 
learn if there is trouble, if they're on time, if they're cheating you, um, or actually talk them into joining the dark side, which is your side. And the same goes for quality, maintainability, and scaling. You will not need uh, uh, you, that your MVP can actually uh, survive a, a TV spot on a major German or anywhere TV station. Quite unlikely that will, you will get one soon, unless you participate in Höhle der Löwen uh, or something like that. But you still need to keep in mind and do whatever you can afford, timing-wise, money-wise, that you have a solid foundation where you can grow later on. So a little bit of quality, a little bit of scalability, and at least a few thoughts doesn't harm. All right, uh, and then a few more words to tech, and then I hope we will get a lot of questions from you guys. Tech, the only question you need to ask yourself is, can I scale my product later once I gain traction? And the scaling goes in two directions. Technically, can, do I have a chance to to take that product and will it actually still work with millions of users? Can I grow it in that or do I need to change the tech stack completely? Yeah? And the second question, and most people forget that, is can I scale it people-wise? Whatever tech I use, do I get engineers? In the beginning, I only need maybe two or three, but let's say I need 20. Do I have a chance to get 20 engineers like that? Yeah. Um, I talked a little bit about that last year also in Bits and Pretzels. I, uh, me, and in, the, in the last year, for example, I was approached by a Munich startup. They built their product in Python, which is a good idea. Python is awesome. But then um, they just failed to get enough of Python engineers. So in the end, they decided to, to build it from scratch in PHP or Java just because they didn't get the engineers. And that is that actually can kill your startup because you lose so much time. And this time, your competitor or copycat of you can actually overtake. And there is also no better technology. It's all about the people who use it. Don't believe anyone who tells you, we need this technology, otherwise we die. Okay, there are rare, rare cases if you build a tech product, if you go into AI, if you go into machine learning, um, and there are a couple of other areas where certain technologies are better than others. Yes, that is true, but in the end, it's always about people. Did the people master the technology? Sorry, no beer yet. Maybe that's a problem, I need, <laughs> I need some. So did the people master the technology or, or they just want to play around with something new? Um, and that's something unfortunate that what I see uh, many, many times that, that um, tech guys talk the founders into using a technology just because they want to try it and they read some awesome articles how good it's going to be. So. What's important? Solid tech foundation. Extendable. You, for sure you need to hack, but please don't hack too much. Do we use programming languages, tools, infrastructure, which you easily scale with people? Are there enough engineers available wherever you are? Don't underestimate that. And don't believe the advertisements that whoever is coding need to be a master in the technology. And you cannot be a master in a technology which just is half a year old. There's no way. Which means, actually, these engineers will test that technologies, and the risk is on you as the founder when you have your MVP coded. It will be your risk. It's going to work or not. And the safe, uh, and the tech people might kill me now for it, the safe thing is just stick with PHP and Java, maybe a little bit Ruby on Rails, okay, depending on the end front end React, that's it. That's the standard right now on Earth. If you're in the US, looks a little bit different, but the US, everything is different in the US. Um, so the tech stack there is a more like uh, Python, 
um, and Go, for example, but in Europe or also in Asia, where I'm mostly located, that's it. So if you're in Munich, you want to do a startup, don't go with something fancy unless you really, really, really need it because the core of your startup is something tech. That's, that's the most important. So these are the basics I wanted to, 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 do, yeah, I mean, to share with you. So for me, the mo now I'm really curious why you're sitting here. I mean, some of you know me and you're sitting here that it's not so empty. I really appreciate that. Thank you, guys. And even in the first row, awesome. So now how about the questions? What is an MVP in hardware? Well, that's a very good question. I have no idea. Uh, so, I'm here to help. Oh, you are, you are, you are uh, choosing the, the questions now? But you were fantastic. You just made me unemployed. That's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> so, what is an MVP in hardware? I have no idea, sir. Good, I'm man. Sorry. No, let me, let me. So, quite simple. You, you need, well, uh, it's difficult. It, depending on uh, what hardware, how you need to manufacture, and what is your test audience. Um, so, if, if, if the hardware is one machine you want to build in the factory, you need that machine. If the hardware is like we had uh, some Kickstarter campaign about awesome headphones or whatever, yeah, you need to see, can I make a prototype? Is the prototype working? Does that prototype a attract people? And actually, in this case, the MVP would be um, the version which can attract your Kickstarter crowdfunding, for example. Yeah, so it's, it's a very generic question. Okay. What's the difference between an MVP and a usable prototype? <laughs> Be precise. Uh, I'm pretty sure a student asked that question. Um, I don't know. I mean, what could... What, did, did anybody have an educated guess on that? Is that even an important question? I'm not so sure. What you need is you need uh, a product you can try, test your theories and assumption. I mean, this is why I started with the definition of an MVP, a usable prototype. It sounds a little bit for me also like a hardware-based question. I would assume so. Yeah. Here's a great question. I bet you've never heard that one before. Where to find a tech co-founder best? Yeah, I saw a booth out there actually of a startup where they had a big sign where they said like, I'm looking for a tech uh, CTO. Ah, I thought they had some. Okay, yeah. so not no. in stock. Okay. No, they, they, were, they, were, they were looking for some. So I think that is um, be on conferences, talk, network. A place like Bits and Pretzels is really good. Even better would be a tech uh, conference like we have in Germany the soon upcoming Code Talks conference, for example. That's where all the nerds are. Uh, why not mingle there and see uh, uh, maybe you could find someone? So get get out there and talk to the people. Just a question for me: How do you judge if they're good? Does it take a long time for you, or is it quite quick for you to establish? Is it like a first question you always ask? Um, well, very good question. So for me, it's actually easy because I have 25 years of experience, so I pretty quickly understand if somebody's bullshitting you or not. Um, for if you're not a, a tech person, it's quite difficult. So what you could, can do, I mean, um, you don't know actually tomorrow's weather, but you can actually guess tomorrow's weather based on yesterday's weather. So what you do is you look what have these people done in the past, do they have references, and please, that's a pitfall. I uh, many times made that mistake myself, check references. Whatever they tell you, wherever they worked for, whatever awesome they did, ask for, can I call that founder, can I ask that person? I, many times in my life, I was like, wow, this is so, such an awesome person. I just believed it. Yeah? And then in the end, it turned out like 80% was bullshitting. Do, do you code review then? Do you let them write code and review it? Or? For, the, for the engineers, absolutely. A tech co-founder is not necessarily the best coder on earth. It's very important. A tech co-founder, a good tech co-founder, could be also a very well-connected person who knows many, many, many engineers out there and bring them to join you. Because everybody... So that's also a pattern I did in the past. I, 
In some companies, I hired people who were not necessarily the best engineers on earth, but they had one of the best reputations. So I hired that person, and that person attracted many, many more other engineers um, just because they wanted to work with that person. So that's also absolutely uh, valuable. So it depends on how many engineers, what kind of startup, uh, and what you need. If you just need one person to code your MVP alone, absolutely right, then you should see if they can do the job. Okay, thank you. Here's an interesting question. Not that the other ones aren't, but just saying. What are your minimum numbers, number of sales, visits, click-throughs to evaluate a successful MVP? <laughs> wow, be wow. very precise and that will double check. Yeah, uh, <laughs> again, that very heavily depends on your area. If you would sell something uh, which costs cents and you earn cents, you should uh, generate a relevant mass of thousands. If you sell, uh, one start off of us, they sell um, um, <clears throat> online industrial uh, auctions, trade auctions. So if you sell a machine for three million US or Euro, so maybe one sale yeah, or one um, interested lead qualified lead would be enough, so you don't know, depending really on the product and, and what you do. So, and then also, it heavily depends on the area. The click-through rates, uh, uh, for example, the, the sales, the visits, also the customer acquisition costs, very different uh, in e-commerce, uh, various music industry, versus um, adult entertainment, that's completely different. Okay, it, it is, yes. Um, how can a product be minimum and should have the same time, a good UX, UI, be lovable and should be complete? Isn't that the final product? So you didn't pay attention, whoever <laughs> uh, fell asleep when I showed you the Potemkin village. Everything customer face, what people, your users see, should be really, really, really awesome. But it doesn't mean that under the hood it exists. As I said, I, going back to that example with the, um, with the advertisement, machine learning advertising al algorithm, that's a real story. That algorithm did not exist at all. What they had were interns and a few smart people who said, like, I can actually place Facebook ads cheaper than other people. And they just came up with an awesome web page and a really awesome fake user interface where people thought that they actually train an algorithm, but in the end, people did it. So to answer that question, everything customer facing, lovable. But it's not how to say founder lovable or something, because you as a founder will end up with a lot of manual work, or you need to deal with interns uh, or teach people how to fake things. So there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, RAT, only good for B2C or also possible in B2B with a small customer base? Absolutely. The, the travel example I did is a B2C uh, uh, question. So can I get users, can I acquire users for a reasonable amount of money is a, is a question each startup in whatever area you are should ask yourself. And if you have the chance to test that with a fake website, which just simulates your product, maybe even under a different name that you can trash it and throw it away, but it looks awesome, and then you just place some AdWords there, you can do that. Yes? Now, your two specialist questions. How many sprints would you invest in an MVP? How many sprints would you maximum invest in new features, as in man days of work? Yeah, that's actually a good question. So we did a lot of uh, MVPs over the last years. Um, typically, an MVP is around two to three months, and then a team would be two to three people. So, because like you need a one front end and maybe one or two back end, or the other way around, depending on. So, to answer that, so 2.5 times three months. So, that would be for me a maximum, and typically, this is also uh, the amount you need to have something which is lovable. Okay. What do you think about you using Redux as a React and Flux pattern instead of pure React? Well, that's yes. a specialist. No, no. Yes, good. Do it. 
So some nerds sitting here or out there, <laughs> I like that. Yes. No, uh, uh, that's the way to go. Absolutely, yes. Cool. Next question. I'm quite curious about that one. How, first, how long should you rat test? And second, when to use Facebook ads or Google ads? That's Again, question. so how long should you rat test until you have the answers to your relevant questions? If you only have one relevant question, test that. Test that. If you have maybe two or three, you need to have two or three tests. And remember, these are explicit. Don't make one test for three things together because you don't know what it is. So make a test for that, for that, for that. And Facebook ads and Google ads, I mean, depends on your business. I mean, whom you're on a reach. Is it social? Is it B2C? Is it B2B? And also, I just simply would try both and see how it performs. Now, the next one, super sweet question. Really curious about your answer. I think I have an idea what you're going to say. Um, Why should a good engineer work at a startup when he can earn a lot more in a bigger company? Um, whoever wrote that question actually is better suited in a bigger company. <laughs> That's what I was expecting you to say. <laughs> quite, yeah, you did? Yes. No, quite simple. So um, if you are part of a startup and that startup is going to be the next Facebook, you can actually earn a lot more. I've been a bit with Kayak for a couple of years. I've met many of the first, uh, one of the, num the first 20 employees of Kayak. They all have a huge amount of money now, and you will never, ever be able to earn that in a corporate. Quite simple. Think of a product like an autonomous car as in five years ago. How would your MVP look like? <laughs> okay. No pressure uh, on that one. No, no, I actually like it. So first of all, I would try to see if I could um, simulate that completely in software because it's all about um, sensor technique and the interpretation of signals. So to see if I can avoid the hardware part because it's costly. If you go in the next step, uh, it could be like a toy car, a buggy car, where you can test and build uh, yourself your uh, test track um, and see if that works uh, and avoid under all uh, circumstances to use a real car. I worked uh, with BMW and Mercedes years ago on real cars and it's incredibly complex and expensive. So for an MVP, rather not. Now, with 30 seconds, I like both questions super quick. How many shares for a junior first programmer, i.e. co-founder? How many shares would you give them, roughly? You have 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, I would not give any shares. I would do an ESOP uh, with a cliff. Because if you give shares and you don't know if that person is there in two or three years, you have a problem because you have already given away shares to someone who is, who is not with you anymore. And the very last question, four seconds. Would you rather hire one senior or two to three junior devs? One senior, very clearly. Remember what I talked about mastering. Uh, if you have one person who knows what they're doing versus three monkeys who just guess. Yeah? Um, I'm not saying that all juniors are monkeys. I mean, don't, don't, don't Twitter this. Lars said like junior developers <laughs> are monkeys. I can see it already. It's like, totally this happening guy, right now, my yeah, friend. Yeah, it's <laughs> happening right now. I understand that. This is not what I, what I meant to say, but you need people who understand what they're doing because the efficiency gain from a really good engineer to mediocre to, to junior bad is, is quite uh, huge. One last sentence to add is also the term junior. We Germans tend to say somebody is junior because he has only or she has only two years of experience and the senior is somebody with 10 plus years of experience. This is not reality. I've seen people, 21 year old, two, three years experience who are way better than other people with 15 years of experience. Don't base it on pure years, attitude, um, responsibility, yeah? social skills and tech skills and, and just achievements. That's what matters. And that can be a person who is 19 years old or 20 years old. Quite Sweet. simple. Thank you very much. Boys and girls, Lars Jankowski, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.